Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlen, uh, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Zoe Rose, who is a cybersecurity consultant uh, and media presence and recognized as one of the 50 most influential women in cybersecurity twice and two years in a row, in fact. I think that in a row part is important there. <laughs> Welcome, Zoe. Cheers, thanks. Yeah, I didn't. So, I didn't lose my coolness for uh, for the second year, which is good. <laughs> yeah. So today, I I thought it would be good for us to talk a little bit about, um, at least to start by talking a little bit about privacy. Um, so there's a, a lot of debate around privacy, you know, from social media privacy to encryption backdoors. Um, these debates sort of go back and forth, and you know, uh, change in terms of prevalence in the, in the in the the market. But I wanted to ask you. Why is it important for the average person to have a right to privacy? Yeah, I mean, you'll often hear that term if you've got nothing to hide, uh, or if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, essentially. But I have a drastic example. Um, if you look back on World War II, uh, if it were not for, I think, I think how to say his name is Rennie Camille, uh, the French military officer, and arguably one of the earlier ethical hackers who actually had to sabotage the Nazi consensus in France to then protect tens of thousands of Jewish people who would have been sent to a death camp. I know that's a bit of a drastic example, but the reality is, you know, your right to privacy can protect you. Right now, you might be following all of the rules, doing exactly what you're supposed to do, but what if there's change? What if there's corruption? What if something not so positive happens, which we see every day? And what's happening in America right now could potentially be quite a big example of that. Um, Black Lives Matter, um, the destruction of the Capitol building or attack of the Capitol building. There's, there's all of these very scary, uncertain things. And I think an average, average person, if they're looking at their life and saying, I want to live free, not harming anyone, and my right to, you know, whatever life things that I need and want access to, I should be able to do that in a way that's safe for me. And that does often mean being able to do it privately. If we also look at innovation, that side of things, of not only safety, but also people making cool discoveries, making cool changes and solving problems, it actually flourishes when we feel safe to make those mistakes. So privacy can actually help us be more innovative as well. Um, I think overall, the biggest concern from my perspective is growing up in a world that doesn't take everything you've said out of context and negatively. And only privacy is going to help with that. Personally, I think I, I didn't grow up with the internet all around me all the time. And so I'm quite happy that I don't have baby pictures or foolish videos of me as a child um, floating around the internet as much as some other people do. So I think that also is, you know, helps me in my life, I would say. So you, you brought up a couple of, couple of points there. Um, I think the first one was that if I were to reinterpret that a little, is that we may think of ourselves as, as average people, but there are extreme circumstances or different circumstances that, that may change that then put us as an average person in a, in a circumstance where privacy becomes important. Having protected our privacy in the past becomes important, I think maybe mm -hmm. is a way to think about it. Uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it's quite scary. I mean, you're relying on if you're if you're okay with ev absolutely everything you do being public knowledge you're relying on nobody to take advantage of that nobody to use that to manipulate you nobody to use that to harm you or gain 
you know, unauthorized access to you or your loved ones. There's, there's that assumption that everybody has the best intentions. Um, but I can promise you that's not the case. Uh, it could be, you know, a stranger, but it also could be someone, which I think we'll talk about in a bit about, um, that maybe appears to have the best intention, but doesn't and could physically or emotionally harm you. Yeah, this idea of of abuse is one that that I think is maybe hard for the average person to to imagine or think about. Um, although maybe easier, you know, in, in today's political climate, that just because someone is supposed to follow the rules about what they do with data they have access to doesn't mean that they always will. And I, I there are lots of examples from history of of uh, you know people abusing the access that they have, whether it's you know, access, you know, as an employee of a corporation or its access as a, you know, a, a person of authority, a law enforcement officer, that kind of thing. I think that that certainly happens. Definitely, definitely. And and it changes. I mean, a really good example, especially this week, is everybody moving off of WhatsApp um, because their terms and conditions changed. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is when I started using it, I had to be coerced into using it <laughs> it's, I guess you could say but um everybody was using it and I hated it but I eventually had to you know go down the route of using it because everybody else was mm -hmm. and um I made that conscious decision knowing who owned that company a lot of people made that decision saying oh it's end-to-end -end encrypted it's safe we're okay what they didn't realize is you know that that can change people you know they may not be honest about everything that's going on. And in the future, if somebody purchases it or if somebody being Facebook gains access to that data, uh, they will use it. Well, and this is an interesting angle on, on um, you know, data ownership or, or and maybe it's right to privacy as well. But this idea that your data should remain yours regardless of of you know, changes in ownership over a company or an app and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a difficult one because in many, many ways, one of the reasons to for one company to buy another is for access to the data that they have. Oh, completely. Uh, it's, it's like 23andMe. When was it sold? 2018? That that company spent, oh, was it 300 million or something? It was a very high amount and mm -hmm. they weren't purchasing the not, I mean, they were purchasing the brand, but they were also purchasing the data. That's why it's so valuable. Yeah, and I think of those genetic testing companies, I think there were maybe, I might get this wrong, I think there were four of them that were sort of big, and at least three of them now have entered into either some agreement or an acquisition that, that puts the data they've collected at risk. But, they're, you know, information security professionals who are always thinking about how things might break um, when those genetic testing companies started being uh, becoming popular all pointed out well this just because they're protecting your data now doesn't mean that they always will no exactly and and the other side is as much as i want to say that we you know maybe we've implemented privacy and security by design but the reality is we're humans even if we're the developers and have the best intentions there will be times where we make mistakes so the typical general user the end user they they need to acknowledge that and there's been cases where i mean and a good example a bit older now but a good example is you know snapchat a lot of people i even had a person come up to me after a talk and say are my pictures actually being deleted and as much as i wanted to say yeah they are i didn't believe it and then it came out that it wasn't. Um, Instagram, I think, recently had that as well, wasn't it? Where deleted data wasn't actually deleted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's it, when people ask that question, are you know, are my pictures being deleted or is my data being deleted? It's very easy for a company to say yes. But if you ask a different question, how do I know that my pictures are being deleted? That's a very difficult question for a company to answer. Because oh, completely. for Snapchat to prove to me as a as a user that my that my data has been deleted is actually quite difficult to do. Yeah, and and actually the Instagram one, if I remember correctly, I think it was a security researcher that did a um, data. Uh, what was the word? 
I can never remember how to say that. Uh, they did a subject access request, I believe it was. And mm. that's where they gained access to data that was supposed to have been deleted mm -hmm. more than a year mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. And that's how they found out, actually, this data is not being deleted. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. So, I mean, this is challenging because I think a, a right to privacy is is one thing. Like, we can we can write into law a right to privacy but what does it mean in practice to keep your data private? Like, is it possible to actually use these social media tools and apps that are so popular and actually maintain privacy? I would say yes, but <laughs> there's degrees of privacy. So I would say the average user probably doesn't need to be 100,000 million percent anonymous. And it's quite expensive and it's quite difficult to do that. Um, I have a background in intelligence and investigations, uh, using data uh, like open source intelligence, which is mm -hmm. investigating publicly available data. And um, the one thing that I would constantly get asked is, I want to be 100% anonymous, how do I do that? And I would say to them, you know, you don't necessarily need to be 100% anonymous. You know, you want to be private, yes. Uh, but there's ways to do it in a way that works for you. Yes, you can use social media. Yes, you can use technology, IoT, or the Internet of Things, so smart devices. But you have to do it with a conscious decision. And what that means is be aware of what device or what platform you're using. Know what does that mean like, for example, uh, where is that data being sent or stored and who is it being shared with? And also, in a less technical kind of perspective, who are you sharing that data with? So if I'm, if I'm a user on Facebook, for example, and I have my community of friends and family, who is that audience exactly? Do I know all of those people? And am I comfortable with, one, Facebook having that information, but two, those people having that information? Because the minute it gets out there, it can be shared. Even if you've got a private account, it can be shared. But also, do you know those people? And I think one thing that often comes up when I speak to uh, younger persons is the acknowledgement that not everybody online has my best intentions in place like maybe they don't what they pretend to care about isn't true maybe they're not actually the person that they say they are or maybe they're not coming from the location they say they are for example and realizing that helps us I know it sounds very negative but realizing that actually helps us design our privacy plan or our online platform plan so that we can maintain it day to day but also it's still positive in our life sometimes that means taking accounts offline that we don't use or don't actually get benefit from and sometimes that means sharing content but knowing what that impact is so a really good example is um sometimes when you post stuff online that has a location attached to it maybe post it once you physically left that location i know there's an actress oh i can't remember her name that um she practices that where she only posts physical identifying locate like pictures and that when she's no longer in that place to keep herself safe and that was her plan and it works for her because she still gets to enjoy sharing but isn't doesn't feel at risk if that makes example um, makes sense, 
And, uh, and so it's, it's just recognizing how much data is in what I'm posting. Um, a good example and one I think does relate to the everyday person is, uh, back in 2017, I believe it was, um, I was on a show called, um, the Kyle Files with one of my best friends, Scott Helm, where we investigated the audience. So it was uh, eight women, I believe it was. And we investigated their social media presence whilst they were speaking to uh, the presenter, thinking that they were there for another reason. Um, to be fair, everything we did was ethical. We did actually have a police officer there um, who did the same sort of investigations himself. Uh, and uh, it was quite, quite fun but uh, quite sobering. And one of the images that I found was a picture of uh, a child. And it was a very loving photo. It was the child had succeeded in some achievement in sports. Uh, it was football. Uh, he was holding a certificate. He was very proud about it. Uh, for the American audience, that is soccer. Um, and, uh, and he was very proud about it. His mom was very proud about it. And she posted that picture online. The challenge that I came across it was, it was a publicly available photo, so I did not need to be friends with her to see it. Uh, it had the child's first and surname. It had his, um, obviously his gender as well, and his location because it said what sports team he was a part of. And therefore, I could then potentially find out who's in his family, I could find out, to make a likely storyline of why I'm there, I could find out his routine, I could find out physically, therefore, where he was at what time, and potentially build a plan to abduct him. And for the mother, that was horrible to hear, because that is not her intention whatsoever. But she didn't realise, because she would never do this, that there are people with those malicious intentions. And so instead of posting something like that photo, she could have posted something of her son outside of any sort of uniform holding a football or a soccer ball, um, and that's it. And that still would achieve similar things. I mean, he achieved something quite lovely. Um, it was a you know um, celebration photo, but... It, it led to more information than it should have. Yeah, I mean, that's such a challenging, I mean, it's a great example of how a photo that's perceived as completely innocent seems like it's it's tailor-made for sharing on social media, mm -hmm. um, gives away a bunch of information that you might not want to give away. And for a parent or for that, that parent who's posting it, it they're, not, they're not thinking about how widely that's being shared. And why uh, would they? And why would they? Because, of course, of all of the, the tools used to share those photos focus not on how widely it's being shared, but on how easy it is to share and how you can mm -hmm. share it with your, your friends and family, that kind of thing. And you would never assume, you would never assume somebody would want to harm, you know, somebody in your connections or, you know, viewing that potentially you don't know. Why would you assume that, that they're to harm? You know, you, yeah, wouldn't, you wouldn't make that assumption. Of course, yeah. Well, and then the other the other example, and the one that I should bring up to be clear, is um, also viewing the ever dreaded terms and conditions. Uh, the reason I mention that is one: uh, if they ever do share your data, they have to either say you you either have to agree to it, or um, you know if it ever changes, like it did in WhatsApp. Um, and also you have to understand what the impact is, you know, who owns that data once you upload it. In some sites, they take that ownership and the only way you can get it down, and there have been situations where getting images taken offline, especially in regards to non-consensual um, pornography or also known as revenge porn, mm -hmm. um, is realizing where was it posted first and can I do a copyright? You know, can I say I own this and therefore mm -hmm. I want to take it down? Um, I'm not saying that you have to read every term and condition and understand it. I swear to you, sometimes they are written to be confusing. Or at least I think they are. But you can do research on people that have already done it. A good example is the Children's Commissioner in the UK. Um, they did, I think it was in 2017, so 
bit ago, uh, they actually reviewed some popular uh, social media sites and rewrote the terms and conditions with partnership of uh, lawyers. I actually have a friend who, um, she's a top privacy lawyer and she helped with this and they rewrote Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, so on and so forth, um, to be user friendly to children even so that they could understand what data they're sharing. And I think it was Instagram's terms and conditions at that time were 17 pages long. They rewrote it into one page. Wow. I mean, that's a huge improvement, but a whole page of mm -hmm. terms and conditions still feels like quite a lot, actually, for <laughs> most people. That is true. That is true. I think at the end of the day, you if you want to be in control you do have to understand that what that means yeah, and true. if you're not going to read it and I, i'll be honest i very rarely read a ton of terms and conditions i love privacy policies because those tend to be pretty short but um, i don't love terms and conditions and i do check them off especially when i'm in a rush so i'm not trying to criticize anyone else but um but i also do you make that decision of what am I going to share on that platform? So uh, you you started to, to touch there on a um, another topic where you have some experience. Um, you volunteer helping survivors of, of domestic violence protect their privacy and data. Tell me a little bit about that volunteer work that you're doing. Yeah, so I currently volunteer with a company called Operation Safe Escape, or sorry, it's a volunteer organization. It's actually uh, registered in America. Uh, and the aim of that organization is to support um, survivors of domestic abuse in those situations, leaving those situations and have left those situations. And um, there's a huge community of people that do things like open source intelligence. So investigating the footprint online, securing devices, uh, even, you know, legal advice, uh, training on how to take back control and retain that control uh, along with how to do it safely and one thing that people often and unfortunately even the media can get wrong is saying secure your accounts lock down your accounts put mfa in place but what they forget is in a situation of domestic abuse and violence taking back control is the most dangerous time I've been a survivor of mm. domestic abuse and violence. I have left that situation and that's actually how I got into my current career. And I can promise you the unknown is absolutely terrifying. At that time, I was not technical and I actually had to be self-taught. And that's how, again, I built this career, but, but it's very scary. It's very scary. And when you make that decision, that you are going to leave. That's actually the most dangerous part. And it has led to situation. I think BBC, I think they released an article this year that said 38% of um, women that are murdered globally, uh, that globally being in the UK, uh, are done by either current or um, previous partners, intimate partners. And the reality is, is when you... When you are taking back control, you are actually in a dangerous situation and therefore you have to do it in a way that's safe. And that does often mean having a community that's able to guide you through that safely. So I, I, you pointed out something there that, that seemed really important to me, because if if someone were to ask me for that advice, first of all, I'm probably not the right person to ask, but I think my <laughs> first response would be, yeah, you should start locking down your accounts, making sure that people don't have access. Uh, that would sort of be the, the key thing. But it sounds like you're saying that that's not necessarily the step you should take immediately. That is, yeah, that's not the first step I would take at all. Um, for me personally, what happened in my situation is I didn't do that. I left and they retained access to... Uh, I believe it was my email at the time and I think a couple of my social media accounts and they uh, when I left I didn't know uh, some of the accounts they had access to I eventually figured it out but I didn't know um, and the reason I did for some of them that I did know is because 
I was scared of this person. Um, they they threatened me um, and they had quite a bit of control over me. And I didn't know the extent of what they would do, but also I didn't know the extent of what they could do. Um, and so that, and that is a common theme that I have seen uh, for many people, is not understanding what impact or what what control they do have ultimately, especially with IoT and you know smart devices and um, smart homes, uh, knowing what's exactly in place, and knowing what access is retained, but also when you make that choice that you're leaving, that abuser is losing control and they acknowledge that, and that's a threat to them. If they can't control you, you could leave. You you could be happy and it, it it wouldn't require them and that that sense of control is very critical to them and so actually by removing their access you potentially are putting yourself f- further into danger and escalation so maybe somebody that was verbally violent maybe they'd become physically or maybe somebody that was physically but not to the point where they you know killed you maybe they would become and and so it's making that balanced choice and and each situation is different mind you but making that choice needs to be done in a safe way as well as if you do need to get out of there quickly you need a way of doing it and uh, in some for some organizations depending on where you are like there there's many around the world uh they may have a safe place for you to go to um all of our people that we work with um we always say you know we recommend leaving the devices behind because there's different things that the abuser could use maybe they could claim you stole their device maybe you could they can still you know monitor it and maybe they can track that device so it's actually much safer to just start fresh brand new devices brand new accounts because in often cases the person doesn't know how ingrained they are it, it's incredibly scary to think about and of course it's it's not something that you generally do think about until until you have to really mhm oh completely and and i mean i'm not saying i know everything mind you i mean a, a lot of my things that i consider are because i've been through that situation and therefore i've i've had to consider it as you said um open source intelligence to me was very interesting because I had it used against me before I even knew the term. Mm-hmm. And um and so I I try to consider all of those different things, but there are situations that I haven't considered. And so I can't blame, you know, a, a developer or a company a, a team of developers that maybe didn't consider that threat map. But what I can do is I can say, well, if you're going to create this solution, you do need to include a diverse team so that these situations are considered or you make it clear that there is a risk to the user uh, in case that they have to be in, you know, they find themselves in those very horrible situations. And, um, and so I think there is the responsibility of the everyday user to protect themselves, take back control for sure. But there's also the responsibility of the manufacturers, of the producers, of of the people developing these solutions to consider who they're who they're marketing to and what that means for their own privacy and their own safety. So, we tell us again the name of the organization that you for which you volunteer that can help people if they have questions. Operation Safe Escape. Excellent. I think, unfortunately, we could keep talking. I think we actually skipped over a lot of potentially interesting details that we could <laughs> dive into, but we covered a lot of topics as well. And I think we're out of time at this point. So, uh, Zoe Rose, I want to thank you so much for spending time with us. It was a, an interesting conversation. Um, thank you for joining us. Lovely. Thank you for having me. And uh, hopefully, if anybody does have any questions or wants to learn more, they could feel free to reach out to me on social media or um, I th- actually for Tripwire, I've written an article um, about um, taking back control. So there are, there are resources out there if they need them. Thank you so much. And for everyone listening, I hope it was interesting and enjoyable. And we'll look forward to you joining us for the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thank you. 
You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thank you.